happy Monday, everybody, and welcome into the Gramlick and McLean podcast presented by Ingles, the official supermarket of Gramlick and McLean. And Mac, tell them what they've won. I'm kidding. What they haven't won anything. <laughs> tell them what episode this is for us. Come on, KG. Three hundo. Are you kidding me? Who would have thought way back in what was it, October of 2020, yes. uh, that, that we'd be sitting here in, in August of 23, uh, going in our, our 300th episode. I mean, truly an unbelievable accomplishment. So grateful for you and all your time. Uh, and, and shout out to Richmond Weaver, uh, to, to Brett Gemmons, our, our whole team. I mean, the, the way it's expanded and grown and, you know, been really, really cool. Could not do it without any of those people, but we couldn't also do it without – uh, uh, some fun guests. So, uh, KG, I think you, you got a couple names for us, right? <laughs> I will get to those. You can find that on social media. I had this idea for Mac that I wanted to list every single guest that we have had on the podcast. And Mac said, KG, you go for it. And I said, okay. <laughs> so we have had 145 guests on our podcast. And I really hope my math is right. I didn't forget anybody. So um, go to social media and find a fun little video that we put together there. But Mac, we also could not do it without Ingles and without their title sponsorship. We appreciate right. them so very much. And we are getting ready. We are getting closer to true tailgate season. Yes. Ingles has everything you need for your tailgate. Get ready. Start going and, you know, checking out what you need, planning out your tailgate, especially for September when you know it's hot, you need a bunch of drinks and all that stuff to, to keep cool. That's right. Ingles has you covered in that regard. And Mac, but we're going to hear a message from Ingles and then get to our guest. I'm super excited about this guy who's one of our absolute favorites. And we talked to him about both Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech. And um, he's one of the best. Who is he again? Tell me who uh, This little, little, little guy. I little actually guy. I didn't mean to say that. He is a little guy. Sorry, Roddy. Uh, Roddy Jones is in the building, and uh, he, he's so good. You know, I, I've done some radio with him. Uh, you know, obviously appearances, guests, been on the pod, all these different things. But he's the guy. I uh, love his insight. Super intelligent, as you guys yeah. already know. The way he was breaking down some of this stuff was – it was super impressive. So Roddy Jones joins us today. Uh, let's do a quick message from our friends over at Ingalls, and then we'll get with Roddy. At Ingalls, we're proud to work with hundreds of local farms and businesses in the communities we call home. Not only does it ensure that you get top quality, fresh items for your family table, it's a way for us to support the amazing individuals who pour their heart and soul into delivering the very best they can do. Quality, freshness, community, it's all in the bag. Ingles, low prices, love the savings. Roddy Jones joining us on the podcast today, man. We greatly appreciate you jumping back on. Episode 300, my guy. So yes. we had to do it big, had to get it an important guest. And wow. uh, you're in, brother. Thank you for joining us. I am honored um, <laughs> to be your guest for episode 300. Um, I'm also honored to be on with two people who I believe since the last time I was on this podcast have become parents. Yes. I don't think I've been right. on since you guys have been parents. Both of you. So congratulations to both of you. My Welcome man. to the club. How is, how is it going? I, Emac, I don't really want to hear from you here. That's Kelly, right. How That's is it going? <laughs> well, first of all, just to be very clear, we are not parents to the same child. Um, we each had our own children. <laughs> That's so good clarification, the, I think most Mac. people know that Mac has a little girl. I have a little boy. We actually just interviewed Mitch Griffiths and I was rocking Jacob in the baby Bjorn right next to me and he cooperated. Sometimes he doesn't, you know, we make it, we make it work, but yeah, he's actually three months old today. So we've made wow. it through the, the hardest part. Question mark. Is that something? Oh, like yes. Yes. oh right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> open our eyes. Yeah. It's Roddy, open our eyes, bro. No, because that's no, what everyone no, says. No. I won't do it. I won't do it. Um, <laughs> It is, it is, you have gone through a very challenging part. Uh, it will remain challenging in some ways, but in different ways. So that's right. Look, it, it, it's best to think that was the hardest part. Now going right. forward, hey, look, the best is yet to come. Oh, sure. Look at that. Um, here's the deal. I Roddy am Sweeney. Very, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I, I am very close to uh, mobility, and it is terrifying. Yeah, it is it terrifying. That's a different ballgame. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's true. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, they are. Mobility is a game changer. Walking is a game changer. Honestly, Kelly, I don't know if you're here yet. Sleeping through the night, a game changer oh, in a positive way. No, no, no. We're not there yet. Com <laughs> communication, a game changer, even when it's just pointing and grunting. Right. Um, right. Some of these game changers are good. Some of these game changers uh, are challenging. But, That's but, right. 
it's it's just a journey. It's I just a journey. It. I love it. Well, we Life appreciate that. And uh, offline, we'll get any parenting advice that you could uh, please offer because you, you I, got, I got nothing, man. Oh, I nobody knows what we're doing. Nobody knows what they're doing. You got, got it to a T. But hey, man, we appreciate you joining us. We have uh, two teams to get into. You know, the, the technical schools. Uh, we got to keep them together. And uh, we thought, who best to do that uh, than you? So appreciate you joining us. Um, we're we're going to talk about Virginia Tech. We're going to talk about Georgia Tech. Talk some little win totals, what you like, what you don't like uh, with, with both of these teams. And it's going to be interesting when we get to those win totals because I think uh, mm. I'm on a different wavelength than Vegas is. But let's Ooh. jump into the Hokies first. So let's talk about these guys. They were 3-8 and eight last year. Really just a tough season, man, full of inconsistencies. Defense was well below their average, but, but be- below average in the league. Um, you know, couldn't get picks, couldn't get sacks. What they're known for, that's what they hang their hat on. And then offensively, I mean, you know, Grant, Grant Wells, there were just flashes, right? There were flashes where you're like, okay, I like that. And then there were other flashes where you're just like, mm, nine TDs, nine picks, sack 30 times, spraying the ball over the yard. So I guess just kind of your initial thoughts on what Virginia Tech could be this season. I think Virginia Tech is sort of a – you see what you want to see. Um, I think very obviously the wins last year uh, or the number of wins last year mm-hmm. stands out. Um, and the play of Grant Wells was up and down. The thing that concerned me about the play of Grant Wells last year is the nine interceptions were a continuation of kind of a trend. I mean, he threw 13 yes. picks the year before at Marshall. So he has been turnover prone in the past. But at the same time, this was a team where uh, the game at the end of the year against Virginia gets canceled. They would have had a pretty good shot in that game. I mean, it's certainly right. a, a coin flip at best and probably in Virginia Tech's favor. They've owned that rivalry. The Hoos were not very good. Um, and look, that game was canceled for the right reasons. But if sure. that game gets played, you could be looking at a four-win team. Then there's three games over the course of the season, Georgia Tech, NC State, and Old Dominion at the beginning. Georgia Tech and NC State are one-point games. Old Dominion at the beginning is a three-point game where cohesion, competence, comfort with each other, the three C's that we all look for. (laughs) If you have that in that game, you've got a pretty good shot against a three and eight Old Dominion team. Mm -hmm. And then one play, excuse me, three and nine, and then one play here and there against against Georgia Tech and against NC State, literally one play, uh, could have changed the fortunes of that game, so uh, of that team. So when you when you look at it, like this is a team that was not very far from seven wins. Now that being said, there were some reasons for concern. The offensive line play wasn't great. The quarterback play was inconsistent. Playmakers on the outside, like it was Caleb Smith and knew who else. Right. Yeah. Um, running back, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> The running back position was banged up for a lot of the year, and they needed yeah. some some uh, some solidification there. And then you mentioned the defense, and I think it was a matter of of a lot of first year people doing a job for a first time. And when you get that, there's reason for optimism. They've gotten some transfers that are interesting, um, but certainly there's a long way to go before we consider this a top half of the league team. Roddy, I hear you. I, I think, you know, when you go back and examine this season and don't just look at, or last season, excuse me, and don't just look at three and eight and just kind of throw it out, there are some reasons to think this team could possibly be a bowl team this year. And maybe you look at a, a Vegas number of perhaps five and a half and, and you lean <laughs> over there, but we'll get to that. Let's talk about quarterback because you guys bring up Grant Wells. Yeah. There's this intriguing Baylor transfer in Kyron Drones. There's also oh, Pop God. Watson, which I, I don't think we're going to see him. I think the main reason is because he's 5'11", 176, according to the Virginia Tech website, and maybe <laughs> they want to make sure he doesn't die. But when you look at Wells and Drones, what, what do you make of that quarterback battle? Because I think it's very much a battle right now. I, I, I think it is a battle, and I, I think what will happen is it's completely um, dependent on how far Kyron Drones goes from a mm-hmm. passing standpoint. Because mm-hmm. physically, he's the more talented of the two quarterbacks. Now, if if he doesn't go, if he doesn't get to the point where he can throw the ball um, consistently and on the mark, and Grant Wells does, and I think you'll see Wells and packages for drones. If neither one of them can throw, you're going with Kyron Drones because he, at least you're going to be able to run the ball with him. So, so I think there's more scenarios where Kyron Drones ends up being the guy long term. Mm. Um, 
but but consistency at that position in terms of taking care of the football has to be the number one thing. And right. I don't know what Grant Wells looked like in practice last year. No one knows. No, none of us really <laughs> know. But you have to have it. But if, if if he was giving them faith last year that he wasn't going to turn the ball over, and then he goes in the games and, and and actually does it, then you have to have a lot of confidence that 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 is has has been rectified this year before you you throw him back out. Um, maybe it was a comfort with the offense. Maybe there was disconnect. They moved Tyler Bowen. Tyler Bowen was the tight ends coach last year, as well as the offensive coordinator. He's now the quarterbacks coach to get more um, synergy, I guess, from right. that position to hear to have his voice in the quarterback's ear at all times. Uh, so maybe that helps correct some of it from a philosophical standpoint. But it's, it comes down to whether or not Grant Wells can be consistent in not turning the ball over. If that's the case and Kyron Jones isn't quite there from a throwing perspective, then I think you see Grant Wells. If right. not, then then you're going to see Kyron Jones. And, and the one thing that is fascinating about that is you brought it up early with, with talking about the receivers. Um, they've got guys now, right? Like you can throw it up and a couple of really nice transfers that they have coming in. And, and it's led by, uh, you, you know, our guy, Ali Jennings. I, I think that that is going to be a, a big difference and really help Grant. But at the end of the day, is it just who he is? Is he just a gunslinger that takes too many risks that gets burned on it? That will be fascinating to see. And then everything with, you know, Kyron and, and his physical abilities, you know, running the football have, have all been glowing reviews. And even talking with, with Coach Pry, uh, you know, at media day and kind of straight up asking him, will you do a two quarterback system? He said, if they both earn time, they'll both play. You know, and, and honestly, he kind of was leaning towards drones being too good of an athlete just to be on the sidelines. Like, yeah. We've got to find ways, and we, we have to involve them. But the interesting thing about all this, and KG, you kind of mentioned it, Virginia Tech fans want Pop to play. They, yeah. They've seen this story before with Marcus Vick. They've seen this story before with Tyrod Taylor, and they didn't play him early enough, and, and mm. they needed to. And then they eventually did, like later in their freshman years. But they felt like those were guys, man, we can't have them early enough. And I think there's there's real concern. Like, you, you can ruin guys. Like, if, if you get them in there – He's 176 pounds. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, just allegedly, according wanna, to the website. Right. Well, I mean, you know, look down at Alabama. They had a little guy. He did just fine. Won a won a couple hey. trophies. Bryce Young weighed uh, more than that, right? I don't think so. I don't think probably so. not Maybe a ton, close. but yeah. I mean, it, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an unfair comparison, though, Emac. That's, <laughs> That's big shoes. Hey, you know, bro. You know, I'm throwing out the big names. I'm I know. Throwing out the big names. Uh, so we'll see. I, I'm fascinated, KG, to see you know what this QB situation really looks like. Roddy, do you get the sense that Pop Watson could be an option here? I don't know. You know, I'll be up there for the spring tour. So, yeah, so we'll follow up. We'll follow I up. I am really excited to see that there. I do think there's a level of optimism around Grant Wells. So I'm going to mount my defense mm. of Grant Wells now. Okay. Um, and, <laughs> and, and probably some of the Pop Watson, let's calm it down a little bit. Sure. Uh, they are nowhere near as good around the quarterback position as they were when Marcus Vick took over or as they were when Tyrod Taylor was there. They're just not. Like, when Tyrod Taylor was 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 close to taking over, they had dudes like Eddie Royal running around. That's right. So, they could use a couple of them guys. They could use, they could use a couple yeah. of them dudes. And, and, and maybe, maybe some of the transfers end up being um, – better they're not going to be any they're not going to be that level player (laughs) um but but grant wells four we we talked about nine interceptions four of those came in the old dominion game at the in the first game of the year two of them probably aren't on him i believe those are on tip balls um so uh, there there was a a he, he didn't it wasn't like he had bunches of turnovers constantly through the season now it didn't always look great and and so that's kind of what what didn't help us forget about that stuff so, so I don't know. I would think if you saw Pop Watson, it would be later in the year. Yeah. yeah. You give this offense time to figure out who it is around the quarterback position to the point where you can insert a quarterback maybe for a spark. Yeah. Um, because early on in the season, I mean, week two, they've got Purdue. Week three, they've got Rutgers. Week four, mm-hmm. they've got Marshall. Marshall was a nine-win team last mm-hmm. year. Oh, Purdue good. won yeah. the big, <laughs> big, big team West. Week one, they have Old Dominion. And, and That's what I'm worried about. I, KG, look, I tried to overlook Old Dominion, but you're right. You I should do it. You week one, it. you got Old Please Dominion. No. <laughs> I mean, it's the return. They're going to Blacksburg, and Ali Jennings has switched sides, which right. is good. That is That's a good for Virginia Tech. Praise, Praise the Lord. Good. Praise the Lord. That is good for Virginia Tech. <laughs> um, but but I, I think that's those those games are too big to throw in a freshman. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. quite frank, man, uh, 
the offensive line, I don't think people are expecting mm-hmm. them to be great. So, yeah. you know, then you throw in that piece of it, guys seeing ghosts, running for his life. I mean, we're, we're worried about, you know, maybe trying to save him, redshirt him, and then let's get four years out of him, right? Yeah. Like something of that nature, if that's the route that, that they end up having to go on. I am very interested in the run game. Um, you know, how much of a boost can a healthy Malachi Thomas give that? Because I think he's a difference maker. Uh, and, and then just with, with drones and, you know, that, that right. one-two punch – given situation, given packages, uh, that will be interesting to see. Let's look at this defense, Roddy, because Coach Pry, like, that's his bread and butter. And he he called the defense last year. This year, allegedly, he is <laughs> separating from that. And, and he's delegating. He's trusting his guys. He's staying away from the meeting room. So he says, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Hmm. I actually think it is a good thing. Um just because I think that the job of head coach is so big right. that you can't give your all to being the defensive coordinator. Chris Marv uh, is one of the brightest young coaches. His name comes up constantly. That that's that's around. I played against Chris Marv in college, and, <laughs> right. and you see how our our paths have diverged. His very successful, and me talking about him, who is very on. successful. <laughs> but Chris Chris Marv Chris Marv is a guy that went to Vanderbilt, came up under Clark Lee. Um, you know, spent some time or, or, or has, had been with Clark Lee, spent time at Penn State, obviously, with Brent mm-hmm. Pry. So, so, so he is a guy that, that I think if you let him give, give the defense, if you let him give the defense his identity, it's better than it having like half the identity of Brent Pry and half right. the identity of Chris Marv. Like, right. I think one voice probably makes them, in, them even better. So, uh, all in all, I think that's a good thing. You know, we yeah. saw something similar. Um, you know, we don't like to talk about the Manny Diaz experience at Miami, but I think all in all, like he brought Miami to a place where he got it on decently stable footing. Although Mario right. Cristobal would probably argue differently, <laughs> um, but Manny Diaz had to make similar changes after his first year, and they got better. So, so I think these changes are good for a first-time head coach to sort of be more of the CEO. Let your young smart, intelligent coordinators go at it, mm-hmm. uh, and he's got some decent pieces to work with too. Yeah. Can I ask this, guys, for both of y'all? Mac, I know specifically you experienced a new offensive coordinator mm-hmm. at Clemson. Mm-hmm. So you you saw that transition. Roddy, I'm not sure if you had a new coordinator. Oh, no. Paul Georgia Johnson Tech. was there the entire time, and he well, was the no, only no, no. one. Oh, we had, a, we had a new coordinator on defense. On defense. Okay. Did Paul Johnson call the plays? Yes, he oh, does. Yeah. He always had that sheet in front of his face all the time, and there's that famous gift. Okay. Anyway. Yep. Is how And Roddy, you're talking about year two. Is – like, how much is there to that? Do you really think that in a year two of a system, I've never been in a football meeting room. Like, mm-hmm. it's so complicated, I know. Can year two really be much easier, not just for the players, but the coaches? Roddy, we'll start with you. Like, <laughs> can that be a big difference maker? Yes. And so Chan Gailey was my head coach my first year, and we had a, an offensive coordinator who had just gotten there. And so I saw that process of, of integrating a new offensive coordinator and what it took. And then Paul Johnson comes in the year after that, and we're going through a whole change, both of scheme, but also other stuff. I think, Emac, the biggest difference between year one and year two is the communication. Um, and it's not just the communication in the meeting rooms. I don't think people realize you change one coach on a coaching staff, and the way you communicate in game changes completely mm. because that coach right. has a different temperament. That coach is going to ask you different questions coming off. That coach may have different verbiage for certain stuff. And it certainly happens when you have a new offense and everybody is trying to learn. You right. just don't know. Like if Emac comes off the field in year one, I have to ask him every single question for information I want. And sometimes he'll give me the answer I'm looking for. And sometimes he won't. In year two, he knows what information right. I want. How heavy? How heavy is the three technique on you? Is he is he really more of uh, almost head up, or is he kind of loose? How twitchy is he? How far? Uh, uh, how how um, how much weight is on his front hand when he's going to when he's going to try and penetrate or slant or step? All of this stuff is stuff that when you come off the field, you can all you can filter the information out that's not important and just get straight to the important information. Right. And so that just streamlines mm-hmm. everything. And then there's a comfort in the system. Like what's important is right. where the linebackers lined up important on this play. Eh, not really, because action right. in the backfield is going to move him. Yes. That's different mm-hmm. in theory than it is in practice when you've seen it a couple of times, Emac. Yeah, and I think it, it, it's just. 
especially when you're redoing a whole system. Like there's sometimes, you know, coaching changes happen and, it, okay, this is still what we're doing. This is still the offense, things of that nature. But when it's a total overhaul like this, I mean, everything Roddy just said, you have to learn the basics. You have to learn what, what is important yeah. to this guy, what is important to that guy. How, how do I communicate on this play? And when it's a totally different scheme, you're learning on the fly too. So now not only the players but the coaches, you know, everybody's just learning – how to communicate effectively, how to execute effectively. And that's a big deal. And, you know, I think when you look at these guys, so much of it is, is a roster thing too. Like in this transfer portal era, Jimmy's and Joe's are at the all-time high. Like, and I look at this defense, Roddy, there's some, but there's not enough. Uh, when I'm looking at just long, athletic dudes and that to me is a key point of emphasis and they're doing that in, in recruiting i mean they, they're putting up a fence slowly but surely around virginia uh with all that talent all that skill set that they have there recruiting wise and they're making it happen but to me it just feels like from a roster standpoint roddy they still have a little ways to go yeah they do um especially to be the virginia tech that that we know and love uh, but I do think there's some pieces like they're going to be good at corner as long as they stay healthy with Mansoor right. Delane and Dorian Strong. Like I, I think they'll be pretty good. Nasir Peoples is a good piece yeah. in that secondary. Um, I have questions about the linebacker position up front. They've got a bunch of guys who we've sort of seen for a while, especially in the middle, who are good pieces. Uh, right. But the impact players is sort of what they're – we don't know right now. We just don't yeah. know who the impact players are going to be because you've got guys like a Morel Pollard or a Josh Fuga or, or, a, or a Mario Kendricks, guys that we've seen before in the middle of that defense who are solid. Right. But who's coming off the edge? You know, who's going to be the guy that's going sideline to sideline to make plays? That's the biggest question for this defense. So I think the defense should be decent. What is decent? Top, uh, yeah. top nine, maybe oh, like man. top, okay. top yeah. ten. I don't know. I don't know. You know, but, but, in the country, in the country. Yeah, right. Right. Oh no. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you for clarifying that, Emac. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I meant. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, man. Like I, this, yeah. this defense was decent last year. Uh, you know, it was sort of a mid, a, a they were in the lower part of the middle tier. Yeah. Middle back, yeah. And I expect them to be there again. Okay, well, let's put our money where our mouth is here, guys. Virginia okay. Tech's Vegas win total is five and a half. Okay. I am going to start by saying, to me, that is an obvious under. Any thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm when, going under, too. When and I Roddy... look at the schedule, I mean, the, the guaranteed wins I see are Old Dominion, yeah. please, Lord Jesus, and Virginia, I think. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, what's crazy is um, you didn't say at Marshall. I mean, that... It's a 9 team, game. like y'all said. That is going to be an uncomfortable game. Yep. And uh, I, I know they lost their coordinator down in Miami now and, and coach, but they got a lot of dudes back, a lot yep. of dudes for Marshall. And so, I mean, this stretch with Purdue at Rutgers, at Marshall, and then ACC play cranks up, Lord Jesus. Stop. Get it while you can. Get it while you can, Roddy. I'm, I'm going under two. I hate to say it. Uh, I, I think it's more of a – I think it's more of a four to three win season. <laughs> these they're gonna have to fight. Fans, they're gonna have to fight. They're gonna have to these fight. These Hokie fans it. deserve so much better, Roddy. Yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna just so we don't get clipped and put on something, I'm gonna take the over. Great. Um tell us where. <laughs> but oh, that's the thing. The in, the entire the entirety of this over is based on the month of September. Like they have to be three and one, four and oh coming out of the month of September. Yeah. yeah. Old Dominion. Purdue, Rutgers, at Rutgers, at Marshall. You got to win Old Dominion at Rutgers, at Marshall at least. We'll see what Purdue is. That's a home game. They yeah. get a new coach. Um, defensive coordinator from from Illinois comes over. They're losing a ton on offense. You know, Charlie mm -hmm. Jones is gone. Durham Payne is gone. Yeah. Um, you know, Aiden O'Connell is gone. So they do have some, like, I think a Purdue second week of the year is probably yeah. a winnable game. It's, fine. Um, yeah. it's a good time to get them exactly. So, so I think if you're if you're if you've got three wins coming out of September, can you find three more? Virginia's won a Boston College at sure. like, at BC. I don't know. Yeah. I like BC, so so I'm probably stretching myself <laughs> there. But but I think I think if if Virginia Tech can win four in September, right? Then they'll they'll hit the over. If they're Dude. three, then I'm going to be sweating the entire year. I mean, if they're if they're four and zero oh going to 
end of the Pittsburgh game. My then gosh. something's gone right. So then yes. I think I mean, something's quite yeah. different here. Because then you're talking about confidence, feeling good. Right. Shoot. That, hey, Eddie Royal's listening to this going nuts right now. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I have been on the I'm going to convince myself of Virginia Tech train ever since <laughs> ACC Media Day. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's hard. That one was a stretch for me. But I did. <laughs> I did it. You did it. We're here. We're proud of you, Roddy. <laughs> okay, you. well, let's talk about uh, your Georgia Tech yellow jacket. Come on. Roddy Jones, a legend of the program, as we know. Legend of the flats. Legend of the flats. By the way, we forgot to mention Virginia Tech picked 11th in the preseason. Georgia Tech picked 12th. So right mm-hmm. there in the same boat, no divisions, in the ACC. And I'll just – let's start with the – well, actually, no. Let's start with the new head coach at Georgia Tech. I was going to say let's start with the quarterback competition. But let's start with Coach Key. Um, Roddy, I, I would imagine you've been able to – chat with him a decent bit and you you have a good finger on the pulse there of what's going on so what did you think of that hire overall and in, what's the vibe early with a new head coach who played there I, I really liked the hire um, because Jeff Collins actually did a pretty good job of increasing the talent on the roster the thing that Brent Key brought when he took over his interim was the structure to let that talent shine I think you just look at their ascension defensively last year and you can see that, hey, this is a more talented roster than we were used to. And mm-hmm. despite the rotating rotating door due to injuries at quarterback that they had, they were able to win games down the stretch. Now, look, some of it was because they did they, teams didn't play particularly well against them. I mean, Pittsburgh, I just watched that game back not too long ago. It was all on. Pittsburgh had three pick sixes that they dropped in like right. the first half. Right. Not great. Um, and yet Georgia Tech found a way to win that game in what down the stretch was a back and forth game. So, so I do think that some of that was, uh, what was the Brent key effect. I also like the fact that he's a guy that coached under George O'Leary at both yeah. Georgia Tech or played under George O'Leary at Georgia Tech and then coached under George O'Leary at UCF, spent time with Nick Saban. You know, I've had a chance to sit down with him. He kept all of his notes from all those meetings, the Smart. George O'Leary meetings, Smart. the Nick Saban meetings. So he's kept them. And you take those pieces and apply it to your program, and I think there's something there. And, and the last thing that I really liked about it was that he has great respect from the high school coaches in the state of Georgia. Because yes. he's been recruiting Georgia for years, going back to his UCF days through Alabama. And he, 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 just, he just is a guy that can sit down in a head coach's office yeah. and be very personable. Yeah. Um, so I think all of those things make it a great hire for Georgia Tech. Where he'll take the program, I don't know, but I think sure. it fits. It's the right hire at the right time. Yeah, it, it's uh, – man, we were doing backflips, you know, on the huddle when he got the job. Just such a great man. And any time an offensive lineman gets a head coaching job, you got to pull for that guy. <laughs> uh, but, no, I think all those reasons that you said on top of one that you were dancing around a little bit, he knows Georgia Tech. He yeah. understands the difficulties. He understands the uniqueness – of a, a school where you have to be an engineer to go to school. Like it, it's tough. Right. And, and everything Mac, how in that environment. Recruit athletic nerds like Roddy Jones. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I think all of that, his demeanor, I mean, that dude gets fired up, man. And uh, you know, it, he cares I'm not saying that people before didn't, but it's just different when it's your school, man. Uh, he, th- there's nothing that he can ask of those young men that he hasn't done 10 times over, you know, being a captain, being an all ACC performer, uh, I, I just think that matters. I think it's powerful, and um, he's got a great shot here. So yeah. I'm excited to see it, excited to see what they get going, KG. You were talking about the quarterback battle. I'm interested to see who, who's going to come out on top for that thing. Yeah, I, I, I am fascinated to see. I, I, I will say on the Brent key piece one more time, um, There is, I, I think there's something special about a coach who can authentically tap into the the – the vein of what makes an institute an institute or a college, right. a college, university, university. The, the One of the people who's done it the best is, is Dabo Sweeney. So you don't have to be, you don't have to be an alum, but he sort of tapped into all of the things that made Clemson, Clemson. Mm-hmm. There's a pride in the upstate of South Carolina around Clemson, but there's also a recognition that for a long time, Clemson didn't get the the amount of attention, didn't have the amount of success that that the people of Clemson felt, and so little old Clemson was like a thing that it, when he said it, every alum was like, "Yeah, we, yeah, we, we are just little old Clemson," <laughs> and you know right. that was that was a really genuine thing, and and there's a, and and now 
now you're to the point where where he has sort of built it into something that Clemson fans have always aspired to and been proud of, and sort of he's, he has sort of tapped into that authentically and instilled it in the football yeah. team. Georgia Tech has some really unique things. Like you are second fiddle in the state. You are who knows what fiddle in the ACC. You got a bunch of rivals who don't think you're a rival, and so being able to tap into that. Being able to tap into that authentically with a football team so that it's yeah. not one message when you walk when you're in the football facility, another message when you walk outside, another message when you're with your parent. No, like mm-hmm. all of those messages are the same. You are right. disrespected. And here's right. why, because you gotta go to class. You gotta do all these different things that makes you a Jordan Tech student athlete. It's it's really it's really powerful. So I think I think uh, I think Brent Key will be able to do that. What were we talking about? Quarterbacks, right? I like the way you put that, Roddy. But yes, that was good. I love that little tangent there. Thank but you. you've got Zach Pyron, who's the uh, incumbent, if you will, and then Haynes King, the transfer from Texas A&M, which is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. From what I remember about Haynes King at A&M, I remember him as an athletic guy, maybe not necessarily known for um, accuracy and, and had some issues passing the ball. But uh, you bring in a guy like that, that's got to at least bring some intrigue to this quarterback competition. It certainly does. Um and Haynes King's really interesting because yeah. so much around Texas A&M when he was really playing last year was just a complete disaster. Yes. Right. So he's running for his life. You talk about ruining guys. Like when, <laughs> when you are playing the teams that they played and running for your life, that's a bad thing. And then Max Johnson comes in, more mobile than we expected. They sort of figure stuff out around him. Right. Um, but he plays more consistently. And so can this be a situation where, where Haynes King sort of has a resurgence? Right. He is athletic. Uh, the reports out of Georgia Tech camp is they have been impressed with his accuracy, which, again, we didn't always – we saw it at times. Didn't always see it at Texas A&M. But I think that there's, a, there's an optimism that not only do you have a good option in Haynes King, but you have a really good option in Zach Pyron as well, who won them games last year and probably would have been the starter right. – uh, for the for the end of the season, had he not broken his collarbone, so so there's a lot of excitement around that quarterback room. And honestly, in talking to everybody around the program, Brent Key's been very close to the vest. But if you talk to people around the program, it's kind of fifty fifty who they think it's going to be because nobody right. really knows. Right, hundred percent. So we'll see. It'll work itself out. That's what the great thing about this. And I think that. Uh, you want to pick one guy. I mean, I know there's there's certainly circumstances. We were just talking about a circumstance with Virginia Tech. When they're so different, it makes sense. Uh, but but when they're similar enough, you don't want to go back and forth. You hope somebody can elevate. You hope somebody can become the guy. Uh, and, and I certainly know Coach Key wants that as well. Looking at these skill players, man, you know, losing Nate stunk. And, uh, you know, understandably so. He's going to play with a, a Heisman Trophy finalist and, and a guy who is – an exceptional quarterback, things of that nature. But when I'm looking at this this roster, there, there's some spots, man, that I think guys can step up and, you know, in the run game, receiving, pass catching, even tight ends. Um, I'm, I feel pretty good about what they have. It's just can they take that next step? Yeah, I, I, it's, it is a question mark as a whole, but you got a guy like Dante Smith in the running back room who gives you a pretty high floor there. What the ceiling is, he's had some flashes. Um, but I think he is best as as a as a piece of a running back room so that he can stay fresh and do some things out of the backfield. Travion Cooley comes over from Louisville, a guy yep. who had some flashes there. Uh, they've been really excited about Malik Rutherford for a few years, but he kind of right. played the same position as Nate McCollum. So now that Nate McCollum has gone, Malik Rutherford steps in. And then you get this transfer in Abdul Jana um, from, uh, from Duquesne, who was a pretty good player for them. Now, how does that translate right. to this level? I don't know. We'll sure. see. But but it gives them some depth. But Avery Boyd has been in a position where he is – they've been excited about him, but nothing around the quarterback – around the the, uh, the receiver position has really let any of those guys stand out this side of Nate McCollum. So, so I'm with you on Nate McCollum. I think he's going to do a great job at yeah. Carolina. Um, but the skill positions do have questions. I do think there's reason for optimism at tight end. Luke right. Benson, the transfer from Syracuse, who was there, um, who was at Georgia Tech a year ago, is extremely fast. Mm-hmm. And Buster Faulkner, the offensive coordinator, comes over from Georgia, where we know how they used to tight ends. Right. <laughs> so if you got a bunch of tight ends, they're gonna they're gonna use them. You know, it's gonna be a big part of that offense. So I don't know, man. It's gonna be really interesting. They've, they've got some pieces, but can mm-hmm. it all come together? That's the biggest question. Well, and, and what about defensively, too? I mean, this defense struggled last year. They've got to replace um, Ely and Thomas, who were kind of the heart and souls of that defense. 
Um, I, it, this offense, I think, has some promise. The defense, maybe a few more question marks. Rodney, yeah, I mean, can yeah. we see some improvement here? Well, what, what, what was so weird, too, it's like it was flashes where the defense was good. Yeah, right? exactly. like They were like, yeah. whoa, okay, th- this looks really good. But then there were also flashes of just getting – smashed so I, I think it's more of a consistency thing probably it, mm. it definitely is they, they sort of feasted on some offenses down the stretch that weren't great <laughs> when you look sure. at, at, at virginia oh, thank you <laughs> you look at virginia you look at virginia tech they gave virginia tech some some scores well yeah. obviously uh, if they tackled better in virginia tech that wouldn't have been a close game right but but ultimately the last two games i think are reason for optimism for this defense yes you look at the score <laughs> in the georgia game they gave up 37 points. They were on the field the entire game. Yeah. And they also, like, provided resistance. They played well. I mean, they played well. Also, it, TCU would have loved to have given up 37 <laughs> points. I mean, come on. I know. <laughs> it would have been nice. At so much, as, Yeah, exactly. As a, as a uh, casual <laughs> observer, we would have liked, had TCU only given up 37 points. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Sure. So, so I do think there's reason for optimism defensively. They are as long in the secondary as anybody in the conference. Um, LaMiles Brooks is a big, yeah. long safety. Uh, mm-hmm. Miles Sims, a big, long corner. Um, so so I do think there's reason for optimism there. The defensive front, they still don't have the guy, Keon White right. leaves. So I don't yeah. know that they have a Keon White type player, but I think they have a lot of like a Sylvain Yonjuin. They got like yeah. eight of those, yeah, which are good pieces that you can roll in. And if you can keep them fresh, maybe they play better than the talent would suggest. The question is at safety and at linebacker, especially right. linebacker, because right. they're going to be really inexperienced here. They got some transfers in from some big-name schools, um, but those guys hadn't really done it. So yeah. ultimately, linebacker is the biggest question. And I'm curious to see what Andrew Thacker does, because he's he has sort of changed his style over the course of, 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 uh, of his time at Georgia Tech. I can remember when they were sort of a 3-3-5 defense. That was really Andrew Thacker's idea, and that defense was pretty good. Went down a more traditional front. Uh, and um, how do I put this? Without as many cooks <laughs> in the defensive kitchen, I think Andrew Thacker could really shine. Yeah, I like it, man. I like it. I'm excited to see it um, because, again, the, the flashes, and I know a handful of those guys are gone, but uh, the flashes that we saw were impressive. And, uh, you know, yeah. if, if you can try to replicate that, do it more consistently, you've got a shot. All right, win total, KG. It's Let's a little different it. than. Then Mac, Mac and Vegas disagree here a little bit. So Vegas has Georgia Tech's win total at four and a half. Mac, you have them at five and a half, right? So I guess I'm going over very easily. I, I would guess say that's so. what I'm doing. I, the I'm thing doing. I like about Georgia Tech's schedule is a lot of winnable games at home. Obviously, right. open with South Carolina State, Bowling Green, Boston College, Syracuse, all at home. UNC at home. You beat UNC last year on the road. Right. At Virginia, I think it's going to be a win. I lean over, gentlemen. Roddy, what you do know, you think? You, you know what I don't like about the schedule? Um, at Clemson versus Georgia in a three-week span. No, well, that's idea. just – that's Not Georgia idea. Tech's life, and they know that, and they <laughs> got to deal with it. Although, usually, Clemson comes earlier in the year, and the Georgia's yeah. the week right. after Thanksgiving. Right. Like, I think that during fun. my career, we only played Clemson in November one time. That was right. 11. Um, all the others, we played them in either September or early October. <laughs> and so, like, that always worked out better. And, and look, mm-hmm. and that wasn't the Clemson behemoth that the Clemson sure. is now. So it was just getting started. Just getting uh, started. I am going, I'm going to go over as well. I think Georgia Tech, I think Georgia Tech hits at least five. And yeah. I think this Georgia Tech team has a real shot of being a bowl team. Um, now, going to Ole Miss, that's a big one. It's a yeah. big one if you're going to be a bowl team. Uh, but but what's the old adage is like if you're if you're a really good team you want all your toughest games at home so that you get that home field advantage whatever if you're like sure. fighting for bowl uh, a bowl berth you want all your your toughest opponents you want those on the road and right then you, then you get those right. more winnable games exactly. at home exactly. so that you get that bump so I do think it sets up <laughs> I do think it sets up well for the Jackets I'm gonna go over and, and look I would not be shocked if September first against Louisville on Friday night in the Mercedes-Benz zone, I would not be shocked if they walked out of there with the dub because sure. this Georgia Tech team, um, th- there has been less churn than there has been for Louisville. And I don't know that the talent discrepancy is as big as it's being made out to be. Right. Well, less churn. My goodness. Louisville has 41 new yeah. players. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Insane. Brand new staff, all that stuff, which I think they're going to be okay, but that's that's a big old number. Uh, I'm going over as well. Um 
I, they've got to they've got to go do it though. I mean, it's going to yeah. be some games where you probably don't pick them, but they win it, and that, that's the type of situation. Which they're they're used to that. They're comfortable in that in that environment. It's going to be it'll be interesting to see KG. What what do they do? I will say on the realistic front for Georgia Tech, like this is a team that is probably going to be exposed a little bit more, particularly defensively. I mean, sure. They were plus 11 in turnovers last year. Right. Mm. Second best in the ACC. Only Duke yeah. was better. Yeah. Those numbers tend to regress towards the mean. Right. Um, so, right. you know, 24, they created 24 turnovers a year ago. Is that going to happen again? I don't know. Maybe it does. Crazy. That's it's a crazy. big number, though. <laughs> That's Two crazy. a game. It's yeah. a big number. Well, and some of that was when, when Key took over. It was almost a rallying, right? Yes. So can yeah. you maintain that? New yeah. season. Um, this is your guy now. You you don't really have that rallying cry. I mean, you do, but you don't. It's not the same as last yeah, year. Yeah, but correct. I I like the chances here with Georgia Tech. I like that over four and a half is a low number for this I, team. It I is think. a low number. I, th- I think they do it. I think they do it. Roddy, you got a thousand more hours of radio to go. <laughs> Somehow you sandwiched us in between. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us. Excited for you this year, man. And he's your. Hey, is this breaking news? Can I say this, Roddy? I, I about think your so. crew. Can I say? Oh it? yeah, let's do it. He's with Roy Philpot, man. He's, he's with another Tiger. So it, we're oh excited to see Roddy and Two and of my Roy favorite people in the biz. I know. That's awesome. I'm jealous, man. That's going to be so fun. I can't wait and to also, see it. He is also the only play-by-play guy that makes me feel tall. So I oh. knew you were about to say that. <laughs> and, and, I, <laughs> hey. and, and I am the only analyst that makes him feel like you not You guys are perfect tall. together, we actually. Are. Me and I can't Roy wait. are not. I can't Aww. wait. I can't wait. I'm going to send you. Roddy, I'm going to send you a picture of Roy and I that it's going to get you going. You'll I like love it. it. It's, yes. it's amazing. Let's it go. makes me look like Black Adam. I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, let's go. <laughs> we appreciate you, man. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Doing the good work. Big shout out to Roddy Jones. Man, he's a superstar. We kind of joked about it, but this dude did. 8 to 11 radio, and then I think he's doing 3 to 6 or so, whatever that window is, 4 to 7. He, and then he slammed us in the middle. We just did 40 minutes of, of work here. So that guy's voice is going to be dead tomorrow. I uh, <laughs> hope he can rest up, son. Ice up, son. Uh, but Roddy's the best. Uh, and, and just a great episode to break down two teams, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, two teams that are right there. Who knows? Whichever way it could sway, you could have a very different season. Um, but we crank it back up you know, next week and and the things that we're going to be able to do uh, continuing our ACC previews of each and every school. So big shout out to him. Uh, That's it from us though, guys, another great episode of Gramlick and Mac Lane. Appreciate our friends over at Ingles for making all this possible. We need you to go over to YouTube, check it out, rate, review, subscribe, leave some comments in there. And of course the OGs over on Apple podcasts as well. Uh, But that's it from us. So until next time, we'll see y'all.